My name is Alark Saxena. I am the instructor for the course on Himalayan diversity, and I'm also the program director for Yale Himalaya Initiative. Today's discussion, we are focused on the issues of biodiversity and conservation and development in Western Himalayas. For the discussion today, we have with us Assistant Professor Shafkat Hussain, who is an Assistant Professor of Anthropology in Trinity College. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Shafkat, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, so first of all, thank you very much, Alark, for inviting me um, to this talk. Um, as you mentioned, I'm an assistant professor at the anthropology department at Trinity College. Um, I, I'm from Pakistan. Um, I grew up um, in the plains area, uh, but I was always fascinated by the mountains, so I spent a lot of my time up in the mountains, and that sort of uh, got me also uh, interested in doing my professional and my academic work there. Um, I have a background in uh, economics, biological sciences, and anthropology, and I've also worked on development issues, on conservation issues, um, um, in northern Pakistan, mainly the western Himalayas and Karakoram region. Um, and I wear sort of multiple hats. I'm an academic, but also a practitioner, and I try to put my um, uh, theoretical knowledge into practice. So I run a conservation program called Project Snow Leopard, um, which uses some innovative techniques to resolve human wildlife conflicts. Um, I teach courses in anthropology development and the introduction to political ecology. Um, I teach basic uh, uh, anthropology level courses. Um, I live in New Haven. Uh, I'm married and have three children. <laughs> well, so tell us a little bit more about your work, um, especially in, um, in terms of uh, snow leopard conservation. Um, so we, I started a, um, a project called uh, Project Snow Leopard, and the basic uh, aim of the project is to resolve human-wildlife conflict. Um, and one of the um, fundamental um, reason for the conflict is, the, um, is that snow leopards kill farmers' goats, and then farmers retaliate, they kill snow leopards, um, and so we have a situation in which both the snow leopards and the farmer, you know, end up sort of losing. Um, so we try to resolve this conflict by compensating farmers for their losses, and in return we ask them uh, that they leave the snow leopard alone. Uh, it's a very simple uh, solution, and I think it's also very logical, um, and so far it has, it has worked. So we work through a, uh, by establishing a community-based insurance scheme in which we, as uh, the donor, also give um, money into a insurance fund, and then villagers, they uh, put in their money um, whatever premium level they want to set, you know, for their livestock. Mm -hmm. And in case there is a kill, uh, the villagers themselves go, they verify claims, um, they then also uh, give out compensations. Um, it's a it's a very uh, locally managed and locally run program, and we try to keep as little uh, involvement in it as possible, mainly uh, because we want the communities to run this institution themselves, but also because it's cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you cannot just go on monitoring each and every activity of the people. Maybe you can um, tell us a little bit more about uh, why is snow leopard conservation so important and through through that also kind of discuss a little bit about the the, the biodiversity of the region that you're working in okay um, so snow leopard conservation is important for uh, two reasons one is that it has it's uh, an intrinsic value uh, we hold that certain elements of biodiversity should be protected uh, because uh, they have intrinsic value, they have value in themselves as these, um, as these species. Um, 
But there is also an ecological argument that these are uh, keystone species, these are um, top predators in the ecosystem. And through um, what is in ecological science is called a trophic cascade, they regulate uh, the entire ecosystem. Now the evidence for the, for the latter reason, which is the ecological reason, is um, not, um, is not fully agreed upon by ecologists. You know, they say, well, you know, it may or may not be. But then, in that case, they still take what is known as the precautionary principles, that if you're mm -hmm. not sure about an, an effectiveness or importance of a species, you can, you know, conserve it nonetheless. Um, its intrinsic value also comes from the fact that it is uh, endemic to the Himalayas. Uh, the snow leopard is not found anywhere else in, in, the, in the world. Um, and it's a rare species. Um, it is, um, rather it is, uh, um, I think it is uh, classified as, as endangered under in the IUCN red list of threatened species. Um, and all those species which are endangered, they need um, certain conservation action. Mm -hmm. um, so, again, both from intrinsic value, its current threatened status, as well as its uh, ecological value, it's important to uh, conserve snow leopards. And um, <laughs> so that takes me to the next question. The communities that you had, that have been um, engaged in this wildlife conflict, mm -hmm. could you tell us a little bit more about these communities? So these are um, subsistence farmers. Uh, they practice mixed mountain agriculture, so that, that means that they have fields um, on the valley bottoms which are uh, fed by these water channels. Um, and then they also keep uh, livestock, um, yaks, um, sheep, and goats, <coughs> which they take up on high pastures during summer. Um, so both agriculture and livestock sort of form the basis for their subsistence. And um, it's a very remote area. It's a very mountainous area. Um, there is very little infrastructure there. There are very little off-farm opportunities there. Um, so um, for local people, livestock is a form of saving. Um, and when um, predators like snow leopards or wolves you know, take their livestock, so they take action. Um, and in some ways, they really cannot afford to lose these uh, you know, valuable assets. Um, so uh, their poverty um, and then lack of, I guess, government inaction mm -hmm. you know, sort of results in this uh, conflict, perpetuation of this conflict. What, what uh, do these communities are of a particular tribal group or do they have um, a little bit more about their background in terms of <coughs> so, ethnicity? Um, you know, this part of Pakistan where I work is now called Gilgit Baltistan. Uh, region, so it's ethnically very diverse region. Um, mainly, you have uh, people who, are in anthropological terms, are called you know Indo-European people or Turkic and Mongol people. Um, and this region had been um, historically very important in transmission of um, various cultures, various religion. So, for example, Buddhism, you know, traveled uh, from this region up into China. Um, then you had also the um, the syncretic uh, Greco-Buddhist uh, culture mm -hmm. at Gandhara. Um, so, uh, the ethnicities that and uh, various um, ethnic group that we see um, in the region today, they are they sort of trace their ancestry to to these uh, ancient. Um, sort of civilization. For example, Kushan Empire was very uh, prominent in, in the region. Then the region was again, I think in the 7th century, conquered by uh, Tibetans. In the 12th century, uh, 13th century, it was conquered by uh, descendants of Chinggis Khan. Um, so you really see a mix of, you know, mainly Iranian, Turkic, and, and, and Mongol people, um, and also Tibetan. Um, so ro the area, specific area where we work or where I work is, uh, is Baltistan and they are mainly um, uh, Tibetan uh, people. They speak an archaic form of Tibetan. Their 
script as Devanagari uh, mm. script. Um, and um, but they have uh, you know unlike sort of Western Tibetans who are mostly mostly nomadic, these people have you know become sedentary. Mm -hmm. um, but if you go to Baltistan, the uh, there are still uh, remnants of uh, Tibetan uh, architecture, especially the motifs in the in the building that you see. Um, and um, religiously, they are Muslims, mainly belonging to uh, Shia uh, minority group, uh, and um, and. Uh, profession-wise, mostly subsistence agriculturalist. That's great. Um, so this this kind of goes into uh, a broader question. How do you see, um, as this course is designed around um, the Himalayas and the diversity of Himalayas, how do you see the region of Baltistan, where you're working, different from, let's say, the eastern Himalayas? Um, uh, ecologically, it's very different. Um, Eastern Himalayas is uh, gets a lot of uh, precipitation, so the vegetation is is Indo-Malayan, sort of you know totally different from uh, Western Himalayas, which is in the rain shadow, um, very arid. Um, in fact, it has been described as a high altitude desert, uh, less than I guess six uh, inches of rain uh, per year, um, and that also if, uh, reflects on the uh, density and abundance of wildlife and also the, uh, the diversity of wildlife. It is uh, um, nowhere uh, as diverse as, as the eastern uh, Himalayas. Um, but it is an important center of some uh, you know, species endemism. So for example, you know, wild goats and sheep, um, you know, the ancestors of domestic goats and, and sheep have come from this this region, um, um, and politically and and historically, this region was also uh, quite uh, different. So this has been one of the highways through which sort of you know all these Central Asian traders, uh, raiders, and mm -hmm. traders, um, you know, came um, into into the subcontinent. Um, it was. Uh, during the time of the British Empire, one of the most important north, you know, frontiers mm -hmm. uh, against against Russians. Um, it is, um, I guess, um, uh, geographically, it is um, uh, is very distinct that it, it is the it is a place where you find the highest concentration of loftiest mountains in the world. Mm -hmm. So within a radius of, I think, 100 miles, you find 60 peaks, which are over 7,000 meters. Um, so um, it's harsh, the environment. Um, the population is, is still very low. Um, and also, I guess, in terms of biomass productivity, the ecosystem is not as productive as in the eastern Himalayan mm -hmm. uh, region. Okay. So that leads me to another question. With such harsh environments, um, how do these communities really um, survive? Uh, do they have, uh, what kind of livelihoods they have? So you've talked about uh, agriculture, uh, subsistence agriculture, and you, they have livestock. Mm -hmm. Do they also in include migration? Um, so what they practice is something called a transhuman uh, system of um, economy or agriculture. So they, um, engage in these altitudinal migration, which means that they take their livestock up on high pastures in, in the beginning of summer, and then they bring them back uh, at the end of the summer. So they go up um, on their high pastures in May and then come back in September what or October. What would be the altitude? Sorry. So most villages, uh, so the average altitude would be about 7,000 feet uh, where villages are located at the valley bottom and then um, high pastures are about 15 to 16,000 feet um, and they go in uh, in, in stages mm -hmm. so as the summer sets in and as snow starts going up mm -hmm. and then exposing you know green and you know new uh, grass and shrubs uh, the villagers you know start moving up and you know uh, grazing their cattle so in the 
at the height of the summer in August, you know, they are at 17, 16, 17,000 feet. And then they stay there for uh, about three, four months, you know, going into side valleys, mainly uh, practicing um, rotational grazing. Mm -hmm. which is um, known to be uh, very sustainable. Uh, it doesn't lead to sort of long-term damage of, you know, rangelands. Um, then uh, more and more people are also looking for off-farm activities, you know, long-term migration to cities like Karachi and Lahore, um, mainly in pursuit of um, jobs and education. Mm -hmm. um, and... Now, with the construction of uh, Metal Road, uh, because it's also, as you know, it's a sensitive militarized zone, so the army has, you know, built Metal Road all the way to the frontier. Um, and so with the arrival of military, arrival of roads, um, and uh, government infrastructure, uh, you know, things are changing. People are moving into uh, service sector um, and, and uh, manufacturing sector. Um, but still, by and large, it's an agrarian um, economy. Um, and if you look at this region um, from far above, so for example, if you take a picture from, from an aeroplane, you will see these green oases, um, you know, in this, in this sort of huge desert mm -hmm. of, you know, just sand and rock. And, um, you know, many people who come to this region for the first time, they said, oh, my God, you know, where is the forest? The forest is gone. They don't realize there's never been a forest okay. here, you know. And but then I think it is one of the only region where. And I am just taking an educated guess that it is the only region where um, vegetation has increased because of human occupation, because, mm -hmm. you know, people have diverted um, glacial water and and created these wonderful, you know, agrarian landscapes. And, you know, and one of my friends who did a uh, study for his master's, he looked at the, uh, uh, the bird diversity and, you know, and he thinks that that has increased because now there's more habitat, people are planting trees, mm -hmm. you know, fruit trees and, and, and other trees. Um, so, yeah, it's really, uh, you know, difficult uh, landscape and very harsh conditions, but through human, you know, labor, really, they have really created these, you know, um, uh, these habitable uh, sort of enclaves mm -hmm. in, in this in, the, in this rather hostile environment. Mm -hmm. And so, um, thank you for this. is a very interesting point um, where most most of the time when we are looking at um, humans as actually an agent of destruction and, and reduction of uh, diversity in the Western Himalayas, we can actually probably find humans as an agent to create more diversity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in, so you've mentioned about the, the current kind of geopolitical uh, changes. Uh, could you speak a little bit more about what you see as kind of happening or uh, unfolding in the, in the next maybe 5, 10 or 15 years? Um, it's, um, it's a very complex, um, you know, at first I will give you the history, you yeah. know, and so in order to understand, you know, how, where, what might happen. Um, so the, uh, the region which is Gilgit Baltistan um, was um, historically part of the state of Kashmir. And <coughs> And um, so then, you know, Kashmir had a, um, a, a wazir -e wazarat who was stationed in Gilgit, who was uh, basically answerable to the Maharaja of Kashmir. Then the British also had their own uh, political administration called the Gilgit Agency, which was run by a political agent. Mm -hmm. And and this uh, region was strategically very important because the Russians were right on the northern border and there was a fear that Russians might, you know, come march through Gilgit. So mm -hmm. um, so the British wanted to basically consolidate this frontier region and they never trusted the Maharaja of Kashmir. Um, and they thought that he was colluding with the Russians. Um, mm -hmm. So they also did not like his uh, governance of the local people uh, in, and also his administration of mm -hmm. Gilgit and, and Baltistan. So at various points, the British tried to take the administration of Gilgit and Baltistan out of the, in the hands of Maharaja and create a separate uh, province mm -hmm. or separate, you know. 
if you look at the um, Treaty of Amritsar uh, when Kashmir was created and given to Gulab Singh by the British, uh, all the the region that is uh, mentioned as being part of the state of Kashmir is everything that is east of the Indus. But a lot of Gilgit uh, area is actually to the west of the Indus. Mm. Um, but in 1891, the Kashmiri forces, along with the imperial troops, they invaded Hunza. They went to the west of the Indus and they conquered that area and signed a treaty. Um, but again, there is a, this gray area where the British are saying, well, these new political districts are really not territorial part of Kashmir. Mm -hmm. They are just the administrative part. And the Maharaja is you know, constantly sort of challenging that position. Um, so that, I that issue sort of never resolves, you know, that where does this west, e the area which is on the western part of Indus belong. But Gilgit and Baltistan in general were part of Kashmir. Um, and again, ethnically, these people are totally different from, you know, the Kashmiri, um, you know, group, uh, which is on the other side of the Himalayas. These are called the trans-Himalayan, you know, mm -hmm. tribes. Mm -hmm. um, and in 1891, a, a British uh, scholar called G.W. Leitner, he went there. Um, I now come to the contemporary point. Um, and he said that, you know, culturally and ethnically, uh, Kashmir should be separated from this trans-Himalayan region of Gilgit, Baltistan. And he uh, proposed a boundary line between Kashmir and this region. And interestingly, it, his boundary line was exactly the same where we have currently the LOC. Mm -hmm. So the LOC is what Leitner proposed to be the boundary between Kashmir and, and, and you know, sort of trans-Kashmir area. And, and that LOC is line of control. LOC is line of control, the de facto sort of, you know, a boundary between India and Pakistan. And, you know, as we know, in 1947, um, uh, there was an uprising against, um, against the Maharaja, uh, tribals from Gilgit and Northwest Frontier Province came and they went all the way to Leh and to Kargil. The Indian forces sort of pushed back. In 1948, there was a sh short war and effectively then what is we have, you know, now the LOC was established and, and both India and Pakistan went to uh, the United Nations and, you know, the United Nations said, well, you'd go and do a plebiscite and find, you know, where you, these people want to go. That never happened. Uh, so both, um, so uh, the current situation in Pakistan is that these people now who are, who were part of the historical state of of Kashmir, uh, cannot be absorbed into the union or the federation of Pakistan. So they have a have a have a sort of very um, 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 you know un. Um, uncertain future in, in Pakistan uh, uh, because Pakistani position is that if we incorporate this region into our federation and make it another province, it will um, mean that we have given our uh, claim over the Indian-held Kashmir. And likewise, you know, Indian uh, claim is, um, is the same that they claim all that part, which is Gilgit and Baltistan, belongs to Kashmir and should be returned to India. Um, what, what should happen is, is again, is, you know, I'm not in a position to really, to really say because it's such a complicated issue. Clearly, we need, you know, the Kashmiris to come in at some point and mm -hmm. say, you know, what they want to say. So, mm -hmm. You know, it's just India and, and, and Pakistan. Um, but it's it's such a it's such a shame that you know this region was historically, you know, through Kashmir um, and through this region, you know, this was one of the sort of you know highways through which you know traffic of culture, religion, goods, material, you know, traveled from Central Asia to South Asia. You, you think know, this is a part of the Silk Route? It was definitely part of the the, the southern artery of the Silk Route. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, the other uh, er, the other um, route was through Leh and Karakoram Pass, um, but this was uh, mainly going into Central Asia and, uh, and Afghanistan. 
And, you know, you still see people, for example, my work is very close to line of control, you know, people whose families are just on the other side and they have not met, you know, for 30, 40 years. You know, some people, they have to go all the way to Islamabad, then back to Delhi, and from there to travel, you know, to Srinagar, and then to, you know, Leh or to Kargil, and then see them, like, take a whole um, trip, which is, I think, maybe, you know, a few thousand miles, and where, you know, they're just right in front of each other across mm -hmm. the river, and they cannot see. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really a very... Um, Tough situation. Yeah. 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 So in that sense, um, do you think um, the, the cha because of uh, kind of lack of certainty in terms of the geopolitical situation, does it really affect the issues of conservation and livelihood for local people? Or does it or does it um, because they are so far off and removed that it doesn't really have too much of a um, issue for, for, the, for these people? Um, for people who are right on the line of control, it's an issue. I mean, you have, you know, it's, sort of, it's an issue of life and death, you know, on both sides. You mm -hmm. know, you have uh, heavy artillery and, you know, mortar uh, shell um, being fired from both sides. Um, in terms of, uh, and clearly, uh, you know, it, it, it destroys agricultural fields, houses, kills livestock on, mm -hmm. on, on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, but it also, you know, for example, as I mentioned earlier, that now um, there is heavy military presence. So, you know, there are opportunities for trade, there mm -hmm. are opportunities for employment, there mm -hmm. are, you know, you have infrastructure, road, you know, all these things that have come in. So where there's a military cantonment, you have, a, you know, uh, a functional school and other facilities. So, you know, it's, it's in that sense, you know, people uh, welcome uh, the presence of the military, but the reasons for which military is there is, of course, you know, they don't, they don't like that. Yeah. 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 Um, and I can, this might be, I might be off the topic here, um, but is this, um, we, we were talking to Zahid and the idea was about creation of this peace park. Mm. Um, is this something that uh, your your region is also associated to, or? Yeah, it's right there. It's the um, it's the Siachen, you know, glacier. So one of the valleys where we work um, is sort of right, um, you know, next to next to this uh, glacier, um, and uh, you know, it's it's just insane that people are fighting at twenty two thousand feet where uh, where. You know, more than 99% of casualties are due to weather, uh, you know, than actual, you know, um, sort of conflict. Um, and there have been um, some movements on on demilitarizing that zone because that was the idea that you create a peace park mm -hmm. and you demilitarize it. Um, uh, but I am not sure how... Um, you know, far along that idea has actually gone. Um, so, but it's, you know, because of um, climate change, because of melting mm -hmm. of the glacier, um, people are now finding out the uh, the scale of sort of pollution because earlier everything was, you know, buried under the snow. <laughs> but now, you know, as, as, as glaciers are melting, you know, and similar things are happening on many other, you know, like trekking routes, for example, to Everest and, and mm -hmm. to K2. Mm -hmm. um, that people are now finding out, you know, like uh, the scale of pollution yeah. uh, that is, and contamination that has happened. Yeah. So uh, this brings me to the two other points that you've mentioned. One is about the impact of climate change mm -hmm. in the region, mm -hmm. and I'd like you to discuss it from the perspective of impact of climate change on uh, on livelihoods mm -hmm. of people, mm -hmm. but also in terms of impact in terms of uh, biodiversity. And the second which is a more connected question in terms of tourism as a livelihood option. Um, how are they working in that region? Um, well, I'm not really a climate science or climate expert. My knowledge is basically based on, you know, my observations and talking to the people mm -hmm. about how weather patterns have changed and how uh, that has affected uh, their agricultural practices. Uh, so people in general uh, say that weather is, um, for example, snowfall is unpredictable now. Mm -hmm. It is, 
it is severe um, and and again it's um, it's it's also unseasonal mm-hmm. um, what it might mean I I'm not sure um, and there's also not um, at least clarity on you know how climate change is affecting um, this region particularly you know because they were at for some point i think somebody mentioned that actually glaciers are growing in this region but then somebody said no actually they are uh, receding and again you know how do you associate uh, this movement you know of glaciers to climate change is difficult mm-hmm. um so um you know, there are extreme weather patterns. There is no question about that, especially, you know, if you go further down south into the plains. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have these, uh, you know, floods, which has become an, which has basically become a common uh, occurrence. You know, every second, every third year, we have these devastating floods. Even, you know, India and Pakistan, we have these. Recent flood, know, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so th- but the only thing, at least, um, um, you know, that is being done is uh, to address or at least, um, you know, look into this issue is is that the ministry in Pakistan has changed its name from Ministry of Environment to Ministry of Climate Change. Uh, <laughs> so hopefully, you know, the name will follow the action or the word will follow the action. Right? Yeah. Um, uh, in terms of tourism, uh, this, is, this region uh, had uh, always been a very big draw for tourists going mm-hmm. all the way back to the colonial times. So in the late 19th and early 20th century, this was the place where all the big game hunters of the British Raj came looking mm. for, you know, uh, the Snow Leopard trophies, Brayer trophies, Mark Hoare and Ibex. Um, mm-hmm. And in fact, um, you know, in I think 1891 or just 1901, uh, we had a a first tourist guide, um, you know, for this region, um, basically instructing and giving guidance to, you know, mainly British, you know, tourists mm-hmm. and, and European tourists mm-hmm. who wanted to go into this region. Um, so it's interesting that this region was uh, relatively open uh, as compared to, let's say, Nepal and Tibet, mm-hmm. you know, in the 19th century yeah. uh, for foreigners. Um, so from, let's say, from 1850s until 1940s, until partition, you know, uh, a lot of uh, um, outsiders, you know, came to this region exploring, climbing, um, and, and sportsmen looking for trophies. Uh, but then after 1940s and till 19. 19- 70, uh, this region was sort of closed. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you had Nepal and Tibet sort of opened up. up So if you really, you know, track the the production of literature on these two regions, Mm -hmm. you will see that there's nothing, you know, in this region from 1940s until 1980s. (laughs) And then if you look at, you know, Tibet and and, and Nepal, there's a lot of stuff that is produced between 50s, 60s, and 70s. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, so 1980s, uh, Pakistan builds this highway uh, called Karakoram Highway, which connects Islamabad and Kashgar. And that sort of became a big draw for the tourists. It sort of cuts across the spectacular uh, mountain scenery. People wanted to relive, you know, the days of the great game of Marco Polo, mm-hmm. of legendary Silk Road. And Pakistani, you know, uh, tourism um, companies, they promoted uh, these uh, these images of mm-hmm. you know, spectacular mountain scenery, these mm-hmm. you know, ancient cultures, um, and uh, so tourism has really flourished. And there are mainly two kinds of tourists who come to Pakistan: one who are looking for adventure, you know, mm-hmm. who want to climb Nanga Parbat or or, or K2, and then you have cultural tourists who mm-hmm. you know who come to look at this you know 12, 1300 year old culture. Many um, um, Hunza has this uh, legendary status that it is a place where um, everybody lives up to 120, 130 years because this is this beautiful valley uh, tucked up in the mountains, you know, cut from the rest of the modern civilization. In fact, some people claim that James Hilton's famous book, Shangri-La, 
was actually, you know, uh, written after after Hunza. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so a lot of tourism, um, and uh, now it's becoming one of the main sources of income for the local people. Um, and uh, there is also growing uh, awareness among local people as well as local NGOs th- uh, about the impact of tourism on the environment. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 at least there are cert, you know certain regulations that are being you know uh, passed by the villagers themselves regarding the like code of conduct for tourists you know what they can bring what they can do what they mm-hmm. can leave behind mm-hmm. um, and uh, and 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 I think tourists themselves are becoming more and more aware you know about their own impact on this on the, on the environment. Do you think the most of the tourism that's happening in the region is uh, local, in the sense, is it more Pakistani um, domestic tourists uh, mm. in the region, or there, there is more um, some international tourism also? Happening? Both, but uh, if you you know take proportionally, you know uh, you know I think there are more um, foreign tourists. Um, really? One of yeah, one of the reasons is that this is um, uh, very remote from you know. Pakistan mm-hmm. and this region. I mean, if you have to drive uh, for about 24 hours to get to Skardu from Islamabad, um, you can, or you can take a 45 minutes long flight. But that flight is subject to weather and gets cancelled every now and then. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, you know, uh, the the main attraction for many Pakistani tourists is not these bleak, dry, and you know, desolate mountains of 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 Gilgit Baltistan, rather the lush green, you know, hill stations of you know uh, the Himalayan slopes like right. Murray and Rawalpindi and Khagan, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So you know, in fact, when many uh, people from Punjab, you know, come to this region, you know, they get very disappointed <laughs> because they think they are coming here to look at you know these pine trees and and snow-capped mountains, but they come and see nothing but rock and ice. Uh, mm-hmm. um, so. Uh, and there is also not much of a like climbing culture, you know, mm-hmm. in in Pakistan. Although mm-hmm. trekking is now uh, becoming quite popular, but then um, again, amongst uh, sort of you know uh, middle and upper classes. Mm-hmm. So, um, but you know, for the main the main attraction for foreign tourists are these five you know big mountains, which are eight thousand meter and above, and you know they all like to come and you know, climb them, it is a big matter. It is a matter of, you know, prestige and mm-hmm. status for many um, international climbers. Um, and, um, you know, luckily, um, in addition to these five peaks, there are lots of other unclimbed peaks, you know, in the area, um, which is a big draw for the tourists. Is, are there restrictions? Um, are there restrictions for people to go into certain peaks, for example, in the eastern parts, there are certain peaks have been given a religious and kind of mm. a, a sacred status, and so they cannot be touched. For example, certain peaks in Bhutan. Mm, no, no, um, everything is fair game, and um, um, there are no um, sort of cultural sanctions against against climbing. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, um, you know, people. Yeah, there are no, you know. Yeah, um, and so bringing this back to kind of the, your your work, which is um, on snow leopard conservation, um, do you see ch- changes happening because of, for that matter, tourism, or for changes in livelihood patterns, or for that matter, climate change? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's um, the region is in is in flux in and in, in, in transformation, especially. With the construction of Karakoram Highway, uh, with the um, arrival of Pakistani government and its bureaucratic and military setup, um, uh, increased and improved uh, communication links. Um, you know, <clears throat> for my PhD, I I worked with a yak herding community um, in a very remote region of Pakistan, basically a region that straddles the Karakoram range and um, is the watershed between South and Central Asia. Um, 
and you have to sort of walk for three days to get to the village. And, you know, there's no electricity, there's nothing uh, from the modern world. Um, but in 2009, when I went there, you know, uh, in this remote area, you had herders who were riding their yaks and talking on cell phones. <laughs> you know, as sort of uh, uh, an image of how far, um, uh, you know, these things have penetrated. Mm -hmm. And they're clearly, you know, changing uh, people's um, social relations. Mm -hmm. um, families are no longer organized around, you know, um, extended family system. People are becoming, uh, you know, using more uh, and more um, education and other means for upward mobility. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in general, um, you know, there is a, there is a consciousness that, um, you know, while the rest of Pakistan is is in turmoil, you know we are here tucked away and quite peaceful, and mm -hmm. and we we should um, you know in some ways they think that because they have been kept out of the Pakistani mainstream political system, mm -hmm. they think that it's also a blessing in disguise, mm -hmm. and um, there's heavy emphasis on education, heavy heavy emphasis on um, on provision of social services by volunteer groups from within the community. Um, and, and, and again, people are becoming more and more oriented towards, you know, economic um, sector other than agriculture. Well, this has been great. Uh, thank you very much for sure. covering it from such a wide uh, range of topics. Um, and this was one of our uh, sections on the culture, livelihood, and diversity of, um, environmental diversity of uh, Western Himalayas. Uh, thank you very much.